You know, before I get into my remarks, I, I did want to make one announcement with the campaign. I'm not very good at remembering the details of campaigning because I get really very much involved in economic policy and foreign policy, and I don't talk a whole lot about the intricacies of the, of the campaign. But, you know, we did just end a quarter uh, for fundraising, and the reports will be out, I think, on the 15th, but we do have pretty uh, sound numbers that we have on the amount of money we collected. And uh, I, I've been told by the staff that uh, we have collected over, over $8 million, and uh, also that our number of donors to the campaign now is over 100,000. So uh, we are very pleased with that and believe that will give us the energy to keep uh, the campaign moving right along since right now there's a lot of energy uh, with our uh, volunteers and with our organization and we have a lot of energy uh, associated with our young people on college campuses so that will continue. But I do want to uh, spend some time today to get started on, in the discussion is on uh, economic policy because uh, in the campaign economic policy right now is a uh, is is the big issue and the, the issue of jobs and and uh, why we're in a recession and and what exactly is going on four years ago this subject came up and uh, even in 07 i was talking about being in a recession and this was sort of fluffed off uh, things have changed a whole lot. My concerns about the monetary system, the Federal Reserve System, the unemployment rate, this, the financial bubbles that we were uh, experiencing uh, early on uh, have all come about where the average person on the street knows there's something very seriously wrong. And this is not like uh, another recession. We've had 17 uh, setbacks um, recession types, some more severe than others, since we've had our Federal Reserve System. So this whole idea that the Federal Reserve is supposed to be the major participant in central economic planning and they're supposed to give us stable prices and they're supposed to give us full employment. I would say the evidence is uh, out there. Uh, they haven't done a very good job. And uh, even though they might give you statistics and say, well, yes, uh, prices aren't going up that much. Actually, we would like them to go up a little faster. And we only have 2% inflation when they measure prices and CPI. But that is a fiction, and I think most people know it. If you go back to the old calculation of CPI, and if you look to the free market economists, you will find that prices are going up at a rate of about 9%. And for some people in the economy, it goes up even faster. So everybody's inflation rate is, uh, is it's not all the same. So, you know, if you're a very wealthy person, you don't really care about the price of uh, gasoline and other things. But if you're living on the margin, or if you're a retired person, uh, it's a very serious matter. And right now, retirees are suffering a whole lot because the last uh, two go-arounds, uh, they didn't get a cost of living increase, claiming that there is no, uh, no uh, price inflation uh, to worry about. But my challenge over the many years and my motivation to get involved in politics in the 1970s had to do with economic policy in relationship to the, uh, the principle of personal liberty. Uh, I deal with, uh, if, if somebody asks me what my main goal is, and that is to uh, uh, restore individual liberty to everybody in this country equally. And then you would have a special way of looking at all civil liberties. You would look, have a, a special idea about what kind of foreign policy we should have, but certainly it would tell us what kind of an economic policy that we would have. So I have, uh, I believe in the free market. I believe the free market is the only humane system that can provide the maximum benefits to the maximum number of people. And I reject central economic planning. My whole problem in a political sense is that we are now witnessing the failure of an economic system that has been with us uh, especially since the 1930s because basically uh, we as, uh, as, as a people in our universities have been taught Keynesian economics and that's planned economy and uh, the Federal Reserve has become the, the, the big central economic planner. But the results right now and the demonstrations on the streets not only around the world but here in the United States demonstrates that there's a lot of people who are pretty upset know there's something wrong and they want something different but the big goal is is to define exactly why and how we got into this mess and what we have to do uh, uh, to get out of it. 
The whole theory behind free market economics is that the uh, Federal Reserve ha is the key instrument for the business cycle. Uh, their job is to monkey around and fix interest rates, the price of money. Most people in this country, most economists, conservative or liberal, are no longer pushing wage and price controls. That doesn't mean they might not try that later on, because wage and price, price controls are coming in medicine, and that's one of the problems we have already, and we'll have it, it much worse. But nobody really is out there saying wage and price controls uh, is something that is beneficial. But when it comes to fixing the price of money, fixing the interest rates, nobody asks any questions. I mean, they just assume, well, the Federal Reserve knows what's best. They know exactly how much money there should be. They know what the interest rates should be. And yet, in free market economics, uh, we have come to understand that prices are key. Uh, the, the, the price of a product tells the businessman and the consumer what to do. If the price is too high, the consumer doesn't buy. If, uh, if the, and, and then the businessman knows what to do. So without that, socialism is destined to fail. And this is what a free market economist by the name of von Mises in 1912 predicted. So he predicted the, the default of a communist system before it was actually really, uh, you, you know, at, 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 at its best level. It was yet to come, but it, socialism was, uh, you, you know, explained to uh, never work, and it didn't work. And we've seen the failure of it. <clears throat> the only question now is uh, whether interventionism, <clears throat> which is what we have today, how long it will last. But money is one half of every single transaction, and yet we don't question the fact that, you know, a couple, a couple individuals secretly, 12 people get together and say, Oh, I wonder what the money supply should be this week. Oh, there's a crisis going on. Uh, let's double the money supply. Let's create $15 trillion worth of bailouts. Who gets the bailouts? Oh, the people who are too big to fail. The people who are too little to worry about, they go and they lose their jobs and they lose their houses. This is all done behind the scenes. The Federal Reserve is bigger and spends more money than the Congress does. And there's no oversight. And this is one of the reasons I have for years and years argued for oversight. Back in the 70s, it was Henry Royce, uh, a chairman of the, Federal, uh, of the Banking Committee, wanted to do it. And Henry Gonzalez, another Democratic chairman, he tried to get it done. It hasn't been done. But we are making inroads due to the lawsuits that have come up and due to a very partial audit that we had uh, last summer. So we are getting some information. The information isn't good. The Fed was involved with probably about $15 trillion worth of transactions, and a third of it was there to serve foreign banks. And when the American people hear this, no wonder they're up on Wall Street raising cane, because they know that the system is biased against the average person. And I think this is an issue that uh, really questions the whole idea uh, of the interventionist system. Uh, and, and what I said at, at my opening remarks was that the free market is the humane system. It's a humanitarian system. It is the very best. And yet it is we who argue for limited government and free markets are always saying, well, you guys don't care. You, you just put people in the gutter. You won't give them anything for free. And this is the result. Well, the result is that uh, the system we have today, whether it's the recession or the result of a financial bubble, just think of the housing programs. We had easy money, easy credit, lower interest rate. Everybody was to have a house. And not only did the Fed make the money available, then there were the affirmative action programs telling the banks they had to make bad loans. And it seemed to work. People were buying houses. It was fantastic. The price of houses would go up and they'd borrow more against it. And people didn't know there was, a, I don't know how anybody could miss it, that there was a bubble out there. So they continued to do that. And then the bubble bursting it was predictable by free market economics. It comes and, and, and uh, what happens? Yelling and screaming and scaring the people. There's going to be a depression. There's going to be a depression if you don't bail out. Bail out the rich, bail out the corporations, bail out the banks, bail out the foreign banks. They didn't get the depression. They got the bailout. What did, what did the Fed buy? They have a trillion dollars worth of uh, securities, these uh, derivative type of securities. Why don't they sell them? Well, they're worthless. So instead of liquidating debt, which is necessary in a bubble in order to get back to growth again, we only just transfer the penalty from the wealthy and the Wall Streeters over onto the, uh, over to the people. But what happened to all this wonderful idea of giving the people uh, a house? 
They lost their job. They, lost, they couldn't pay their mortgages. And now they're losing their houses. And there's no end in sight. And the basic flaw in this is the prevention of politicians from allowing the markets to correct because politicians can't act with, with hands off. They have to do something. Prior to the 1930s, there were uh, recessions and depressions, and it usually came because of distortion of money and credit and, and uh, pyramiding debt, and the correction had to come. But the, at that time, there was not this Keynesian obsession with bailing out people, so the depression would last a short period of time. In 1929, the recession lasted for, I mean, 1921, the recession and depression lasted for a year. We don't even study it in history books. But in the 1930s, that is when the Keynesian interventionists had uh, come in vogue and you had to do something, and, and, uh, and it started with Hoover, and then it went into Roosevelt, and, and it gave us a depression that really didn't end until 1947. This idea that war ends depression, it's a, it's a distasteful uh, idea that still floats around. Have a war and get rid of the depression. Uh, yes, it gets rid of unemployment, but where are the people employed? Carrying guns and getting shot at and getting killed. But uh, real growth didn't come until about 1947. That was after millions of troops came home. The military budget was slashed in more than half. Taxes went down 30%. And we went back to work again. But we're doing the same thing, <clears throat> same thing that the Japanese have been doing for a couple decades, propping up bad debt. And that's the most difficult thing that we uh, have to deal with, is allowing these mistakes uh, uh, to, be co to be corrected. Now, the, uh, this, th these ideas have floated around a long time, and they are connected to those ideas of personal liberty. Because we should see people as individuals and not in groups. I, uh, it was mentioned in the introduction about uh, who can and who cannot serve in the military. And, and I see that as uh, th those problems that we've had in the past is too often we see people, well, in, in the very long past, people were mistreated because they belonged to certain groups, which was very evil. But now we still see people trying to gain advantage. Oh, I belong to this group or this group or this group. And uh, a, a person that understands personal liberty sees everybody as an individual. And it has nothing to do with the group that you belong to. And it's a, it is a system of thought that is very tolerant. In, in many ways, it's uh, the, way we should look, the way we look at our First Amendment. Uh, we're very tolerant about our First Amendment in, in many ways because what we do is we say, well, you can say things, you can, and the First Amendment is there to protect you from, to say controversial things, and we don't question the fact that you can study very, very vicious philosophies. Just think of how many millions, hundreds of millions of people were killed by uh, communists in the, in the 20th century, but we don't outlaw that. So often people are annoyed when I talk about personal liberty is they get annoyed. Well, somebody might use their personal liberty to practice a habit that I can't endorse. Legalizing people to make freedom of choices as long as it doesn't hurt other people is not an endorsement because you can read something and you have the First Amendment rights. That doesn't mean we endorse those things. I mean, if we could allow individuals to pick and choose their intellectual lives and their spiritual lives, why is it we've gotten to this point that we are obsessed with regulating people's personal habits and dependent on the government that we tend to complain about so much that the government will always take care of us. We've now accepted the notion that governments uh, can protect us from ourselves. And it's very, very dangerous. And, uh, and it's a careless attitude about civil liberties. But uh, we, we need to, uh, of course, look at other policies. I've talked a little bit about the uh, Federal Reserve and the importance of sound money, but the other, a couple other reasons why you need one sound money. If you happen to be opposed to massive expansions of the government, whether it's the entitlement system or the perpetual wars that we're in, uh, you can't be for a gold standard or limitation because that's the way you finance it. That's the way it's been done for thousands of years. Uh, they've known about debasing the currency and diluting the metal and clipping coins today. It isn't just printing money. We just use a computer. But it, it cannot be financed. These wars would have never started if we'd had to tax the American people. The founders did their very best 
to try to put the control of us going to war in the hands of the people through in a, in a Congress, never in the hands of the executive branch and in the hands of the king or the president. And yet today the Congress have graciously given up that prerogative and the people, and they don't seem to care and, and <clears throat> they listen to the war propaganda. Listen to the war propaganda going on currently. I mean, we're on the verge of going to war against the Iranians and the Pakistanis. We have 7,000 drone missiles stationed around the world. And we assume that we can drop those any place we want, any time we want. And guess what? Sometimes innocent people die. And sometimes those innocent people, when they die, have families. And sometimes they get very annoyed by that. But the real irony of this uh, stationing bases with drones uh, around the world, uh, both the CIA as well as the 9-11 Commission acknowledge the fact that a significant uh, event that helped prompt the 9-11 uh, attack was the fact that we had military bases on what was considered holy land in Saudi Arabia. So immediately after 9-11, we took that military base out. And the CIA has talked about blowback for a long time, and the commission acknowledged this. But guess what? We're loading up the Arabian Peninsula with these cruise missiles, these uh, drones and cruise missiles. And you think it's going to go unnoticed? No, it's not going to go unnoticed. There are more suicide attacks in one month against American interests and Americans around the world, not in, the co in our country, around the world in one month than they incurred in the entire period of time prior to 9-11. So we're under direct threat. It's very dangerous. It's going to get worse. And accepting the fact that the president needs more authority to pursue this war that is undeclared against everybody, any place in the world, oh, well, what the president needs is more authority. He, he can now assassinate people without due process, American citizens. And people cheer it. I mean, what, what is going on with this country? And uh, if, if it would make us perfectly safe and rich, and we have to sacrifice our liberties, you know, it would be pretty tough. But it's exactly the opposite is happening. Exactly the opposite happening. We are less free, and we're certainly broke. These wars have cost us $4 trillion, and, uh, and, and that is a major contributing factor to, to our national debt. But this is not new. This is what's happened throughout history. Empires, they get too big, they spread themselves too, uh, too thinly around the world, and they self-destruct, just as the Soviet system did. There is no more chance of us having what people think could be a victory in, via, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan and the man the moon. There's no chance whatsoever. All we have is drain, drain our resources. Just the other day up in New Hampshire, we had a significant group of veterans. That, uh, many of them came back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Support my candidacy and uh, it's it's one one area where I am very pleased to, to announce also that if you add up all the donations to all the other Republican candidates from military active duty people I get twice as much because they're sick and tired of these wars and they know they're not working out one young man that came the other day he was practically in tears and talking about all his buddies that he lost in Afghanistan and you know what his concern was now which is something nobody cares about it's hardly written about. It's all his buddy, so many of his buddies now are committing suicide because of the long-term consequences. And what about the 40, uh, the 8,500 who died, the 40,000 with severe injuries, hundreds of thousands begging and pleading for help at the Veterans Administration, and we want to go and start more wars? I mean, what did Gates say when he left uh, the OD? He, he said, the uh, Defense Department, he said, anybody who wants to start another war under these conditions needs their head examined. And we need our heads opened up. We need our brains opened up. We need to pay a little attention to what's going on. That's what we really need. And it is going to happen. Economically, it's happening. That's what the demonstrations are all about on the streets. And one of these days, the people are going to wake up and connect the excessive spending that we do in these wars overseas and, and our economic de decline here in this country. So I uh, believe very sincerely that we're in a, in, a, in a crisis period of time right now that it's going to be uh, a do or die situation. We are at a point where I think uh, we've essentially, hopefully I'm wrong, essentially have crossed the Rubicon. You know, we have crossed that, 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 uh, that barrier from republic to, uh, to dictatorship, to tyranny, to empire. We have our empire, 
We're in, uh, we're, we're in 150 countries. We have 900 bases around the world, and people are, are egging for more, more war. So we do have the empire. But what, what about the financing? What happens in a, uh, in a dictatorship? They have monopoly control of the creation of money and credit, and they have that through the monetary system that we have. Also, it's the loss of civil liberties, whether it's the loss of civil liberties with our war on drugs or our IRS or the war on terror. Uh, what privacy do we have yet? Today they're talking about the institutionalizing. The government can call up all cell phones because uh, there's a trillion dollars worth of loans out there for the students who aren't ever going to be able to pay them. They can't even get jobs. So what we're going to do is deliver all the telephone numbers to the government so they can bug all these kids that have been abused and say, when are you going to pay your bills? Uh, I mean, we, we've lost our privacy. We, we're, uh, we have an announced program of assassinating American citizens. We're in, uh, we're in perpetual war. And uh, we, we've essentially lost, uh, uh, you know, our, our republic. And, uh, and, and so this has to be re reversed uh, uh, ra rather, rather quickly. Without a strict adherence to the rule of law, let me tell you, things go downhill, and I believe that is the case. So my advocacy is for the cause of liberty, the cause for which America stood one time, the cause of sound money and free markets, and, and trying to get people to, to uh, get their courage back again and say, oh no, if the government doesn't do it, it's going to be destroyed. Yes, the government gave houses to everybody and they gave free education to everybody. Now they're in a dilemma and they have to follow up on the, uh, on, on the consequences of this. We have lost our understanding. There's a better understanding now of the free market economists and sound money than ever before. The evidence is quite clear about what the founders were talking about, a non-interventionist foreign policy. Mind our own business. We can't solve the problems of the world. We can't go into nation building. There's, these fights have been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So we are going to be forced to make changes, and there's no reason that we can't make positive changes. We can get out of this, but we have to change policy. We cannot do it with the same monetary policy, the same economic policy, and the same foreign policy. That is, that is a, 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 just a figment of an imagination if you think you can do this. You can't tinker on the edge. We don't have a budgetary crisis. We have a crisis in our understanding of what the role of government ought to be. The budget is the symptom. The taxes are the symptoms. We have to ask one way or the other, what, what should the role of government be? Is it to take care of us from cradle to grave and police the world and tell us what to do with our personal lives? Or is it to protect our liberties and give us sound money and enforce contracts and protect property rights? There's a big difference. And it is, it is that part that made our country great and prosperous that we are giving up. We are seeing it disappear before our eyes. And young people know it. The young people are awakening. They know they need something new and different, and they are coming, and they're listening, and they're studying about the foreign policy, and they're sick and tired of what they're inheriting. So I would say that uh, there's every reason for me personally to be very optimistic for the changes that have come about here in the last, uh, in the last several years. So I will continue to do this. I will continue to do the campaigning, and quite frankly, I feel pretty optimistic about how the campaign is going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. We have a number of questions that were sent in uh, over the Internet, as well as uh, some members of our audience and head table here. So we'll just sort of dive in. And I think what I'd like to do, first of all, is sort of try to... Uh, uh, translate what you were talking about in your speech to what you might do as President of the United States. Because it's, it's certainly one thing to be campaigning for the office, and as President Obama himself has found, it's another to occupy the White House and try to work with the Congress. Uh, the American people seem to be somewhat dissatisfied with the lack of ability to enact policy uh, in Washington, uh, given the budgetary, dare we say, process over the past several months. So you're President of the United States. We don't know what the complexion of the Congress will be, but uh, what, what are the several steps that you would take that parallel the campaign speech that you just gave, which would work to attack some of these larger problems that you're talking about? In order to get the economy growing again, you have to liquidate the debt. 
uh, you liquidate the debt by quit bailing out these, these agencies, which means veto the bills where the Congress tries to bail out the special interests, as well as curtail what the Fed can do uh, in the best and most rapid manner possible for them to get out of the business of taking care of their cronies. And uh, this would be a, uh, a really very strong message. But there has to be a lot of spending cuts as well. And uh, I am uh, I'm going to be proposing in detail uh, a cut in spending of a trillion dollars. You know, we're a trillion and a half in a deficit. And all this talk about cutting in the future of fu in, and tinkering on the edges and cutting future increase, it means nothing and the American people know it. So we need cuts this time, so I would propose the cuts that we need to do. I would guarantee that we would not be abusing the civil liberties of individuals. I would bring the troops home, let those military personnel come back here and start spending their money right here at home, which would be an economic stimulus. So there's a lot that, a lot the president can do, but also working with the Congress is key, and this is where I think a philosophy that I'm talking about brings people together, not by two sides sacrificing their beliefs, but I work quite well with progressive and liberal Democrats. Uh, we had coalitions of trying to prevent the wars. Uh, they st we still exist and talk to each other trying to get us out of these wars. Uh, so, and progressive and, and liberal Democrats are more attuned to trying to protect personal civil, civil liberties and at the same time bringing people together in, in, uh, and, and realizing that we do have to cut spending. So it is a major task. There is no doubt about it. But uh, I believe the program I want to talk about has a much better chance of solving our problems than to continue with the status quo. Okay, so a couple of follow-up questions since you're at the National Press Club and we like to keep our reputation. Uh, if you're, why can't you outline what the spending cuts are today? And if you're going to bring all the soldiers home, we've got 14 million unemployed people in the United States right now. Yes, we'd like for them to be great consumers, but where are they going to find jobs? The, um, you know, what you, what, the first thing you bring them home, you don't put them out on the street. So they just spend their money here at home. But if you want to look at a good example, uh, historically and economically, look at what we did after World War II. I think there were like five or six million people. They just got out of the military. And they came home. And they slashed the military. They didn't stimulate the economy. They slashed the military budget like 60% and cut taxes 30%. And that's, we finally went back to work again. So uh, I wouldn't be frightened by that. If you understand the market, you, you don't have to be concerned about it. But as far as indicating the cuts, uh, you know, I can talk in broad categories, and I'll be glad to do that, but I want to design a program where you can even see it on the line item. But ultimately, in the mil and also in the introduction, this is not a criticism, but, <laughs> but it frequently happens uh, about uh, when we talk about the defense budget. I don't want to cut defense. I want to cut the military. You know, uh, Eisenhower tried to teach us something about the military industrial complex building weapons that we don't use and fighting wars we don't have any business being in. So we're not cutting defense there and I described a little bit about the foreign policy. We have less defense because of that. I mean our Coast Guard is over in the Persian Gulf. Where do you think our National Guards are, are, are when we want to use them to help rescue operations when natural disasters hit? They're over in Afghanistan. So I would say yes, you can cut a lot. You can cut hundreds of billions of dollars out of the military budget. You can cut programs that have no constitutional authority. Where, where does the authority come to have a Department of Energy or a Department of Education, a Department of Commerce, a Department to pass out subsidies to farmers? I mean, will they not exist if we have free markets and sound money? I mean, we have to understand how the markets work. We have to have confidence how the market works and how freedom works. But the cuts can be there, and uh, hopefully in due time, the specifics will be there, and you can look at every line item which we're going to cut. But uh, it, it'd be, I mean, you could, uh, you could slash the budget probably by 70% if you said, Anything that is not authorized directly by the Constitution no longer can be paid for. I mean, it is this total lack of respect for the Constitution, whether it's going to war or, or reinstitutionalizing prohibition without a constitutional amendment. All these kind of things, we have just gone so far from what was originally intended by the uh, founders of this country. So just to follow up then, when would you have specific ideas about where to cut? When would you have those specifics? A couple of weeks, I, I believe. Um, 
But um, I'm probably more specific than, than others. You know, if I want to get rid of the Department of Education, Department of Energy, <laughs> Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture, and cut the military budget in half, that's a pretty good start, and that's pretty specific. Okay, very good. Very good. So you talk quite a bit in your speech, and you can stay up here uh, if you want, uh, otherwise we're not going to get any more questions in. Uh, you talk quite a bit in your speech about the protests now occurring on Wall Street. What, what do you see as, uh, what do you see as you, your areas of agreement with those people? And as president, what would you do to ameliorate their concerns uh, since they seem to be very upset primarily with quote unquote big business and the banks? Uh, right, and I can't speak for the people out there because I don't know who they are and exactly what they're demonstrating against. I can, I can argue the case for uh, their right to express their outright frustration with what is going on. Some are liberals and some are conservatives and some are libertarians and some are strict constitutionalists. And if you read carefully a lot of what I've written uh, on economic policy over the last 10, 15 years, I talk a lot about this, that eventually we will go bankrupt. Eventually we will undermine our productivity. We've had no new jobs in the past 10 years, yet we've had 30 million uh, uh, increase in our population. That eventually our jobs would go over Seas and the pie would shrink and there would be an aggressive attitude to get a piece of the pie that's no longer there. And this is what we're seeing. So you will have a mixture up there. But as far as the federal government involved in, uh, in the practice of civil disobedience in the various states, it's really up to the states to deal with it. I, I think civil disobedience, uh, if everybody knows exactly what they're doing, is a, legitimate, uh, uh, is a legitimate effort. It's been done in this country uh, for many grievances, and some people end up going to jail for this but uh, to speak for a special group and say uh, yeah I like what they're doing or they're not doing but uh, what I want to do is try to sort it out and tell people why why they're struggling and that this was a predictable event and the solution is really getting a healthy economy back and you can't get a healthy economy until you deal with the many things I've just got done saying You've retained, uh, this is a question from the audience, you've retained a solid block of the Republican vote in the polls. What do you need to do to push into the top tier of the Republican field, and what do you plan to do? I personally plan to do exactly what I've been doing for 35 years, and that is uh, talking about the philosophy of liberty, and now it's more appropriate because people need something, and they don't like what they have. I'll continue to do that, but we're going to continue to run a very uh, well-run campaign. Uh, we're raising enough money. We're not competing, uh, of course, with people who can wave a wand and, uh, and get money from the big, uh, big donors, but uh, we're going to continue to do the same. But really, the litmus test is the primaries. We have to prove ourselves in the early primaries, and that's where we're very encouraged. So are you focusing your attention on the early part of the process? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I spend uh, more time in uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, no doubt. One interesting dynamic of this campaign, which seems a little unique, is, is not only the shift in leadership in the polls through the process so far, in the sense that one person seems to lead one month and then may fall uh, to, the, to uh, the middle part of the pack to, uh, after that, uh, the other part is the, the seeming uh, yearning for someone else to jump into the campaign and the headlines of the past 24 hours uh, focusing on Chris Christie. Uh, how do you explain uh, this yearning which some voters seem to be engaged in to see someone else jump in? Uh, does that say anything about the quality of the people who are currently running? No, I think it represents the, uh, the failure of the system and what is offered up is, uh, you know, the status quo. Uh, the ca candidates, uh, I think, uh, that I am up against uh, represent a very much of a status quo, Ke Keynesian spending, militarism, and, 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 it, and it doesn't answer the questions. It doesn't even ask the right questions. It doesn't ask the right questions about what liberty is all about and what about the Federal Reserve and a change in the foreign policy. Uh, those, those those questions aren't being asked, and I think that is the. Uh, and they keep looking. Uh, they keep looking for others, but uh, quite frankly, I, I have an uphill battle. Uh, for instance, I, I imagine that uh, everybody in this room, I'll bet, knows who won the straw vote in Florida. See, I want to see a hand up if you don't know who won the straw vote in Florida. Everybody knows. Does anybody know who won the straw vote in California? There, one person. 
It just happens that uh, yours truly won the straw vote in California. And, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a non-event. It was a non-event. So I have an uphill battle, you know, and, uh, and, and it was well, well documented. As a matter of fact, the documentation of the total ignoring of me coming in tied for first place, essentially, in the Ames straw vote, uh, the, it, we, we at least were able to turn around that the exclusion <laughs> of, of me being tied for first place became an issue, and I think we did quite well. I don't lay awake at night, uh, lie awake at night worrying about this because that's part of the way the system works, but it also explains why if there is somebody out there offering something different and something American people like, uh, you know, we have to compensate for our ability to get the message out. Where I feel good, if I go to the university campus and get 1,500 young people out, they've gotten the message because they don't depend on the conventional uh, method of getting their news, and they use the internet they know what's going on, and they are giving me a lot of encouragement. So is that to say that you have a problem with the way the news media is treating your campaign? No, I just accept it because that's the way it's been. <laughs> Every, all politicians have a problem to a degree. Yes, I would say that uh, if you want to see an explanation of it, is, uh, 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 look at Jon Stewart. He demonstrated it rather dramatically, you know, exactly what was going on. And, uh, but... Uh, you, you know, yes, it, it makes a big difference. So, uh, but I think that if, if we're worth our salt and we can raise the money and we can communicate, uh, I would say, you know, for the most part, I, I really get a pretty fair shake. But sometimes when it's, you know, this whole thing, I, I'm really not the right person to ask is why these things happen because I don't have any idea. I, I think people should be asked, uh, why, why is some things news and other things aren't? And uh, it's, it's a fact of life. Questioner says that you have raised more money than uh, many other uh, Republican presidential candidates. You have legions of small donors and passionate supporters. Why hasn't that translated into a better boost at the polls and last time around into votes in the primaries as well? Well, this is a, it's a different world compared to four years ago, so we can't hardly even talk about it because uh, uh, the fundraising is easier, the support is uh, uh, much greater, uh, the organization is much more organized, much more professional, and uh, our polls uh, do not discourage us, uh, both in New Hampshire and in Iowa. And, and that will have to, that will be the, the litmus test. You have to finally do well in the polls. You have to overcome all the obstacles of, uh, of, of getting the message out and raising the money and getting the organization in. So, uh, no. Uh, but as far as progress is concerned, I'm uh, pretty satisfied with the way we've made progress. So obviously um, you brought up the issue of fundraising in, in your speech and that you're feeling good about that. The questioner asked, what kind of a boost do you think Governor Perry will get from his announcement that he raised $17 million for the campaign and uh, would he be regarded as the front runner? Uh, maybe, but uh, if you get uh, $8 million, half as much, uh, and you get it from small individual donors who are fervently engaged in campaigning for you, that's a lot different than uh, getting money that more likely might have come for the other candidates from the special interests. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't get that type of money. I've, I've been on financial services, uh, you know, for all these years, but, you know, bankers don't come and donate me any money. <laughs> you know, I wonder why. <laughs> because they know where I stand. <laughs> so, uh, no, I think it's much different. So, uh, all, all donors are not equal. You know, uh, I will take uh, my smaller donations with the enthusiasm of the people who send me the money. Well, since you raised the issue of raising money, and, and obviously you're reliant on that in the system in which uh, you toil, how do you feel about the way that the system now works in the sense that money, fundraising is such an important part of it? You have the Supreme Court giving a certain amount of power to corporations that uh, was not given to them in the past. Does that make it more difficult for a candidate like you that uh, doesn't have, uh, isn't working through the system the same way as other candidates might? Um. Probably, but I don't know how important it is. Uh, you know, the president says he'll raise a, a billion dollars. <laughs> so that money, money is big stuff. But there's a limit. I, I look at it on the more positive side. There's been some very wealthy 
individuals who self-financed, and they may win, but they might not get reelected, and sometimes they don't win, so money isn't, isn't the, uh, the only issue. So uh, I think that, uh, you, you know, the funds are obviously very important, but uh, I, I don't think this is an invitation uh, to say that we have to uh, limit, limit this. I, I believe in, in freedom of, of people to spend their money. The problem isn't, you know, a lot of people say, it's the money, it's the money that's driving it. No, it's the power in the government, the power in the government to control our lives and the economy and pass out favors. Uh, and besides, if you have individuals that might resist the, the, the temptation to accept it. They don't donate my money to me, and the, and the lobbyists don't even come to see me. And that's quite a bit different. So I don't think uh, money is pretty darn important, but uh, I, I don't think it's the, uh, the final answer. And, uh, of course, we have to prove ourselves. So we have a student from the University of Tampa who asked the question, why is it, and I'm obviously we're assuming he's right by posing the question, or he is, uh, why is it that you receive more donations from military members than any other candidate? Is that true, first of all? Uh, that is absolutely true. And uh, I did mention it in the talk. I said that um, I got, uh, I think I did, <laughs> uh, I got twice, well, we don't know about this quarter, but uh, up, uh, so far, I've gotten twice as much, more than twice as much money from active military duty than uh, all the other Republican candidates put together. So that should be a message. Also, more than Obama got. And he's the commander in chief. Uh, so, but it tells me one thing. The young people, the military people, they're sick and tired of the war. They want to come home. That's the message I'm governing. Every single day, those numbers are growing of, uh, of the fruitlessness of this war. And it is up to us, the people, to look at this as a moral issue and a constitutional issue. If we looked at this as a moral issue, a monetary issue, and a constitutional issue, we wouldn't have lost one soldier over there. And it's just endless. It's on and on and on. Uh, and it's because we break the rules. If we were more restrained, matter of fact, before we went into Iraq, I'm on international relations, I made them vote on a declaration of war. I said, I'm not going to vote for this, but if you want to go to war, you go to war and vote for it. Be up front. Oh, no, we don't want to do this. We want to just give the president the authority and make up his own mind. And that, of course, is the example of uh, the loss of the republic and delivering what the, one of the reasons we fought our revolution, why the founders explicitly said the president can't go to war this way. And look at where we've been. Look at where we've been. I was in the military for five years in the, during, during the 1960s. And uh, that war wasn't declared. Korea wasn't declared. We don't even care about national sovereignty. We go to war under the UN banner and NATO, and now the president doesn't even tell us. He goes and starts another war in Libya, and he doesn't even mention it to us, and we have to dig it out. And what is so, so discouraging is the lackadaisical attitude about the people. But that is what I'm hoping to change, and quite frankly, I think we are changing that. I think there are some polls that show now that a definite majority of the American people say enough is enough, it's time to come home. So you re and along those lines, you recently suggested that the killing of the suspected terrorist in Yemen could be an impeachable offense. Um, and this is after, I believe, you seem to agree earlier with the suggestion that U.S. military involvement in Libya was also along those lines. If that's indeed the case, and you know, you're saying the American people should have the courage of their convictions that they may or may not have, why not then go ahead and draw up the articles of impeachment? Well, I'd have to do it for every president I've ever seen around here because, that, <laughs> because they haven't followed the Constitution, and it's a practical matter. Uh, I mean, there's, if, if there's not going to be an endorsement. Uh, uh, nothing's going to happen. And they asked me whether that was an impeachable of, uh, uh, offense, and it is. I mean, just ignoring the Fifth Amendment and assassinating an American citizens without due process, and won't even tell us what the rules are. Oh, but he's a threat. Can you imagine being put on a list because you're a threat? What's going to happen when they come to the media? What if the media becomes a threat? Or a professor becomes a threat? Someday that could well happen. This is the way it works. It's incrementalism. Oh, you know, fear-mongering. This never would happen in America. It's slipping and sliding, let me tell you. So uh, I, I would say that uh, we, we shouldn't do this uh, with totally ignoring this. We better pay attention to it. But I'm not sure you answered the question other than to say you would have had a 
do it for every president. If, if, if indeed you believe that's the case, why not, why not go ahead and press the case? I don't think it accomplishes anything because the sentiment is not there. So uh, I, I don't think that would, uh, you know, be achievable. I think it's more important uh, that we educate the people to understand how offensive it is. And then if there is a consensus, uh, you know, then, then that will come along. And I'd probably have a coalition of people that would agree with that. A lot of people now are having second thoughts about, about that assassination. Uh, but uh, this was an announced policy in February of 2010 by Dennis Blair, and he used the word assassination. Sometimes on the media they'll say, oh, Ron Paul says it's going to, he was assassinated. Where did he come up with that word? From Dennis Blair, who said that uh, that is now our policy. And just think of the list we already have at the airport. You are a potential terrorist by uh, going through the airport because they can violate all your civil liberties. And uh, they, they can put you on these lists. How do you get your name off a list if you're a threat? Some, and thousands and thousands of people uh, are on these lists. And uh, like I tried to demonstrate in my talk, we are not safer for it. We're broke and we're in greater danger. And this whole idea, you know, Robert Pape is somebody I've read and studied along with Michael Schur. Schur was a CIA agent. Main, his main job was to uh, trail and deal with Osama bin Laden. Robert Pape he is the expert on suicide terrorism. And uh, he says the number one reason on every suicide terrorist attack that he has studied, the number one reason why somebody would do it, is occupation. So we go into new, in various countries, we go in, uh, we, we invade a country, uh, people get killed, and uh, then they shoot back, and they're all terrorists. And therefore, we have to expand our war to go after those who are trying to kill us because we're occupying their land. I don't know why we can't think about a, a foreign policy uh, of, of, good, of goodwill, you know, of treating people how you would want to be treated. The golden rule could apply. Just think of anything that we have ever done in any country of the world in the last 10 or 15 years, if any country would have ever done it to us. You know, what if, what if uh, in the next 10 years we get a lot poorer and China gets a lot richer? And they started drone attacks on us? Oh, yeah, there's an enemy. We've got to get him. He's an enemy of the people. <laughs> We, we, we can't allow that to happen. And this is, this is where, what is going on today. There is a transition away from per protecting personal liberties. And I, I want to protect these liberties. I don't want prior restraint on the media, certainly, but I don't want prior restraints on you as an individual. You know, why can't we apply this whole principle of, of prior restraint, this uh, censorship of the media? We respect that. But we ought to do that for all individuals rather than saying, oh, he's a threat, he's a terrorist, and, uh, but we don't have to tell you why we put him on the terrorist list. Well, if they have a reason, tell us. Have a trial. I mean, we tried Adolf Eichmann. I mean, this, uh, the Israelis tried Eichmann, you know, and uh, just think of his monster. All the Nazi criminals were tried. They, they were taken to court and then executed. Uh, uh, the, the, there are you know, quite a few examples like that. that uh, McVeigh. McVeigh is another one. Oh, everybody knew he did it. But the reason we do this is because we want to protect the rule of law for ourselves. Not, not for the... It's sort of like you protect First Amendment rights to protect the right to say controversial things, not to talk about the weather. You know, and that's why, that's why you have to protect the courts. Not because they're the bad people. We're not protecting it for them. We're protecting it so that it doesn't get out of hand. And it is a crucial matter. So when you talk about the cause of terrorism being the occupation of other lands, how did that fit into what happened on 9-11? <clears throat> Uh, read, read Michael Schur and uh, Robert Pape. They give you the clear Break it down for us for 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Um, it is the fact that uh, the, uh, the explained reason for hitting us on 9-11 were military bases in Saudi Arabia. There was one. Like I said, 9-11 uh, Commission conceded that. CIA conceded that. They all said that the constant bombing and the killing of many innocent people in Iraq for over 10 years, which was challenged on TV, national TVs, to Madeleine Albright, 
And she acknowledged, yes, probably 500,000 died, but that's the price you have to pay. And, uh, it, 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 and that, those are the reasons that they gave for doing it. And it is very real. Uh, another good example of this is, and what he points out so clearly, is when the occupation stops, the terrorist attacks stop. Lebanon is a perfect example. We went into Lebanon in the early 80s, and uh, we were seen as occupiers. We were attacked, and 241 of our Marines were killed by suicide terrorists. Eventually, we left, we left soon after that, the French left and the Israelis left. There was no more suicide terrorism. It, it just stopped like that. And uh, the interesting thing, is, this is worth looking into, when Reagan wrote, wrote his memoirs, uh, he said he said that he would never turn tail and run, but he did because he had not realized the irrationality of the politics in that region, and he said if he had been more neutral, followed the policy of neutrality, those Marines would still be alive. And that took a lot of courage for Reagan to write that and admit the shortcomings in his foreign policy at that time. Hey, Congressman, we're almost out of time. Uh, before we get to the last question, a couple of housekeeping matters we like to take care of. A reminder about upcoming luncheons. On October 13th, uh, Secretary Ray LaHood with the U.S. Department of Transportation. Uh, on the October 19th, Natalie Cole will talk about the American Liver Foundation's public health initiative called Tune In to Hep C. Harvey Levin from TMZ will be here October 24th to talk about the changing landscape in entertainment coverage. And on October 31st, one of your uh, opponents, Herman Cain, candidate for the Republican uh, presidential nomination, will join us. He'll be followed November 3rd by Tom Brokaw and November 9th by William Shatner. Now, uh, before we do get to the last question, we'd like to uh, present you, Congressman, with our uh, small thank you gift, and that is the traditional NPC coffee mug. Thank you very much for being here today. <laughs> Here's our last question. Of course, your son is a U.S. Senator, and since the Senate is considered the upper chamber, how is his world on the Hill different and perhaps even better than yours? <laughs> <laughs> well, it reminds me of a little story, because the first day we were sworn in together, uh, we were on the same TV program, and they were sort of poking a little fun at me. How do you feel that your son now is in the Senate and you're in the House? And I said, well, I've already told him, I said that if he does a real good job as a senator, that he eventually might be able to get a seat in the House of Representatives. <laughs> How about a round of applause for our guest speaker today? Thank you, Congressman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here today. I'd also like to thank our National Press Club staff, including our library and broadcast center staffers, for helping to organize today's event. And a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. If you'd like to get a copy of today's program, you can check that out at www.press.org. And I'll reach for the gavel and say thank you, and we're adjourned. <laughs>